Hello, welcome back. Let's play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we continue with the quick mission showcases. So today we are going back to uh, some American aircraft and we are actually going to be doing, actually, I just want to go here just to look at the maps. Um, let's see here. We have, uh, yeah, you know what? That's probably going to be a good map. Uh, so let's set over to the Iraqi theater. And today's aircraft is going to be the KC-135 Stratotanker. Uh, let's set to 20. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so if you shift click on... Wow, I never knew that. So if you shift click on any of these... It brings up that uh, box with the options uh, instead of having the cycle through. Oh my god, that's going to make cycling through this stuff so much easier. Oh, ho, ho, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, it's so. I've never, I've never seen this before. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be just flying the KC-135 Straddle Tanker, um, Gains Fighters Anthology, and its constituent games, um, USNF-97 and Jane's ATF, do not simulate uh, aerial refueling. It is something that is simulated in later Jane's games, I believe, perhaps even starting with United States Air Force, but for sure by the time I think of when they did like Jane's F-15 and Jane's F-18. Um, so I'm not going to bother adding other aircraft. It would just be these aircraft basically flying in formation with us. Um, so we're just going to fly a racetrack, uh, over Iraq, much like, um, uh, our tanker aircraft are doing right now, probably. Um, you know, they fly from bases in, you know, either Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, or maybe even Iraq, probably not Iraq, um, or Bahrain. And they'll fly a racetrack over Iraq, and they'll provide in-flight refueling services to aircraft that are striking, you know, ISIS um, forces in Syria or something. Uh, so that's basically what we're going to do. So let's jump in. Now, I believe this is another um, aircraft based on the Boeing. Let me let me check here before I. Oh. Oh, wow. It's even older than I thought. So I thought this was based on the Boeing 707. Like a lot of uh, American mil... Oops. Oh, that's annoying. All right. Stick, joystick. There we go. I had a... I was playing the uh, uh, Batman game. Uh, replaying Batman Arkham Asylum and... I had to disconnect my joystick uh, because otherwise it got seen as a controller. So this actually isn't developed uh, from the Boeing 707 like I originally thought. And like a lot of uh, current U.S. military support aircraft are like the, I think the um, RC, well, I suppose the RC-135s would be based off of this, but uh, stuff like the E-3 Sentry or the E-8 Joint Stars, uh, no, this is developed off the aircraft that the Boeing 707 was developed off of. So this is an old boy. And it's got a curious green paint scheme in, uh, in the game. But, okay, we're going to climb to 30,000 feet. And I think we will circle there for a little bit. <clears throat> AC-135 entered service with the United States Air Force in 1957. And it is one of nine military fixed-wing aircraft with over 60 years of continuous service with its original oper sorry with its original operator kc-135 is su supplemented by the larger mcdonnell douglas kc-10 extender and studies have concluded that many of the aircraft could be flown to and excuse me that many of the aircraft could be flown until 2030 although maintenance costs have greatly increased the kc-135 is to be partially replaced by the boeing kc-46 pegasus 
Starting in 1950, the Air Force operated the world's first production aerial tanker, the Boeing KC-97 Straddle Freighter, the gasoline-fueled piston-engine Boeing Stratocruiser, USAF designation C-97 Straddle Freighter, with a Boeing-developed flying boom and extra kerosene or jet fuel tanks feeding the boom. The Straddle Cruiser airliner itself was developed from the B-29 bomber after World War II. In the KC-97, the mixed gasoline-kerosene fuel system was clearly not desirable, and it was obvious that a jet-powered tank aircraft would be the next development, having a single type of fuel for both its own engine and for passing to the receiver aircraft. The 230 mile per hour cruise speed of the slower piston engine KC-97 was also a serious issue, as using it as an aerial tanker forced the newer jet-powered military aircraft to slow down to mate with the tanker's boom. Like its sibling, the commercial Boeing 707 jet airliner, the KC-135 was derived from the Boeing 367-80 Jet Transport Proof of Concept Demonstrator, which was commonly called the Dash 80. The KC-135 is similar in appearance to the 707, but has a narrower fuselage and is shorter than the 707. The KC-135 predates the 707 and is structurally quite different from the civilian airliner. Boeing gave the future KC-135 tanker the initial designation of Model 717. In 1954, United States Air Force's Strategic Air Command held a competition for a jet-powered aerial refueling tanker. Lockheed's tanker version of the proposed L-193 airliner with rear fuselage-mounted engines was declared the winner in 1955. Since Boeing's proposal was already flying, the KC-135 could be delivered two years earlier, and Air Force Secretary Harold E. Talbot ordered 250 KC-135 tankers until Lockheed's design could be manufactured. In the end, orders for the Lockheed tanker were dropped rather than supporting two tanker designs. Lockheed never produced its jet airliner, but Boeing would eventually dominate the market with a family of airliners based on the 707. I think 30,000 feet is an appropriate altitude to be a cruising with, so we are going to make a turn to 000 and continue our... Uh, Pattern kind of kind of getting north to uh, more northerly, so we're closer to the Syrian border. So actually, you know, I might do uh, three five zero. Hey, uh, three four zero sounds good. There we go. All right, all right. 1954, the Air Force placed an initial order for 29 KC-135As, the first of an eventual 820 of all variants of the basic C-135 family. The first aircraft flew in August 1956, and the initial production straddle tanker was delivered to Castle Air Force Base, California in June of 1957. The last KC-135 was delivered to the Air Force in 1965. Developed in the early 1950s, the basic airframe was characterized by 35-degree aft-swept wings and tail, four underwing-mounted engine pods, a horizontal stabilizer mounted on the fuselage near the bottom of the vertical stabilizer with positive dihedral on the two horizontal planes, and a high-frequency radio antenna which per protrudes forward from the top of the vertical fin or stabilizer. These basic features make it strongly resemble the commercial Boeing 707 and 720 aircraft, although it is actually a different aircraft. Reconnaissance and command post variants of the aircraft, including the RC-135 rubber joint and EC-135 looking glass aircraft, were operated by Strategic Air Command from 1963 through 1992, but they were reassigned to the Air Combat Command. United States Air Force EC-135 Looking Glass was subsequently replaced in its role by the U.S. Navy E-6 Mercury aircraft, a new build airframe based on the Boeing 707-320B. All KC-135s were originally equipped with Pratt & Whitney J57P 59W turbojet engines, which produced 10,000 pounds force of thrust drive and approximately 13,000 pounds force of thrust wet. Wet thrust is achieved through the use of water injection on takeoff, as opposed to wet thrust when used to describe an afterburning engine. 670 U.S. gallons of water are injected into the engines over the course of three minutes. The water is injected into the inlet and the diffuser case in front of the combustion case. The water cools the air in the engine to increase its density. It also reduces the turbine gas temperature, which is a primary limitation on many jet engines. 
This allows the use of more fuel for proper combustion and creates more thrust for short periods of time, similar in concept to war emergency power in a piston engine aircraft. In the 1980s, the first modification program retrofitted 157 Air Force Reserves and Air National Guard tankers with the Pratt & Whitney TF-33 PW-102 turbofan engines from 707 airliners retired in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The modified tanker, designated the KC-135E, was 14% more fuel efficient than the KC-135A and could offload 20% more fuel on long duration flights. Only the KC-135E aircraft were equipped with thrust reversers or boarded takeoffs and shorter landing rollouts. The KC-135E fleet has since either been retrofitted as the R model configuration or placed into long-term storage, as Congress has prevented the Air Force from formally retiring them. The final KC-135E tail number 56-3630 was delivered to the 101st Air Refueling Wing to the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group at Davis Monthan. Air Force Base in September of 2009. The second modification program retrofitted 500 aircraft with new CFM International CFM-56 high bypass turbofan engines produced by General Electric and Safran. The CFM-56 engine produces approximately 22,500 pounds force of thrust, a nearly 100% increase compared to the original J-57 engine. The modified tanker, designated KC-135R, or KC-135T, depending on whether it was modified from an A or E variant or a U variant, can offload up to 50% more fuel on a long duration sortie, is 25% more fuel efficient, and costs 25% less to operate than with previous engines. It is also significantly quieter than the KC-135A, with noise levels at takeoff reduced from 126 to 99 decibels. The KC-135R's operational range is 60% greater than the KC-135E for comparable fuel offloads, providing a wider range of basing options. Upgrading the remaining KC-135Es into KC-135Rs is no longer in consideration, however. This would have cost approximately $3 billion, or $24 million per aircraft. According to Air Force data, the KC-135 fleet has a total operation and support cost in fiscal year 2001 of about $2.2 billion. The older E-model aircraft averaged total cost of about $4.6 million per aircraft, while the R-models averaged about $3.7 million per aircraft. These costs include personnel, personnel fuel, maintenance, modifications, and spare parts. In order to expand the KC-135's abilities and improve its reliability, the aircraft has undergone a number of avionics upgrades. Among these was the Pacer Craig program, or Compass Radar and GPS, which ran from 1999 to 2002 and modified all the aircraft in inventory to eliminate the navigator position from the aircraft. The fuel management system was also replaced. The program development was done by Rockwell Collins in Iowa. An installation was performed by Bay Systems at the Mojave Airport in California. Block 40.6 allows the KC-135 to comply with global air traffic management. The latest block upgrade to the KC-135, the Block 45 program, is online with the first 45 upgraded aircraft delivered by January of 2017. Block 45 adds a new glass cockpit, digital display, radio altimeter, digital autopilot, digital flight director, and computer updates. The original, no longer procurable analog instruments, including all engine gauges, were replaced. Rockwell Collins again supplied the major avionic modules, and the modification work is being done at Tinker Air Force Base. And we are descending, so let's change that. And I think uh, if we set to 255, we should be good. And there we go. Now we just have to climb to uh, return to 30,000 feet. And typically, um, the tanker racetrack would be a lot tighter. Like, you'd see um, maybe something like this, if even that wide. Um, but I'm just trying to burn up time in the air so we can uh, 
go through this without having to, you know, look up from what I'm reading every five minutes to change course. Further upgrades and derivatives. The KC-135Q variant was modified to carry JP-7 fuel necessary for the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird by separating the JP-7 from the KC-135's own fuel supply. Body tanks carrying JP-7 and the wing tanks carrying JP-4 and JP-8. The tanker also had special fuel systems for moving the different fuels between different tanks. When the KC-135Q model received the CFM-56 engines, it was redesignated the KC-135T model, which was capable of separating the main body tanks from the wing tanks for the KC-135 draws its engine fuel. The only external difference between a KC-135R and the KC-135T is the presence of a clear window on the underside of the empennage of the KC-135T where a remote-controlled searchlight is mounted. It also has two ground refueling ports located in each rear wheel well, so ground crews can fuel both the body tanks and wing tanks separately. Eight KC-135R air, air, air aircraft are also receiver-capable tankers, commonly referred to as the KC-135R parenthesis RT. All eight aircraft were with the 22nd Air Refueling Wing at McConnell Air Force Base, Kansas in 1994. They are primarily used for force extension and special operations missions and are crewed by highly qualified receiver capable crews. If not used for the receiver mission, these aircraft can be flown just like any other KC 135R. The multi point refueling systems modification adds refueling pods to the KC 135's wings. The pods allow refueling of U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps aircraft as well as most NATO tactical jet aircraft while keeping the tail mounted refueling boom. The pods themselves are Flight Refueling Limited Mark 32B model pods and refuel via the probe and drogue method common to Navy and Marine Corps tactical jets rather than the primary flying boom method used by Air Force fixed wing aircraft. This allows the tanker to refuel two receivers at the same time, which increases throughput compared to the boom drogue adapter. The number of KC 135A and KC 135B aircraft have been modified to the EC 135, RC 135 and OC-135 configurations for use in several different roles, although these could also be considered variants of the C-135 straddle lifter family. The KC-135R has four triple fan engines mounted under 35 degrees swept wings, which power it to take off at gross weights of up to 322,500 pounds. Nearly all internal fuel can be pumped through the tanker's flying boom, the KC-135's primary fuel transfer method. A boom operator stationed in the rear of the aircraft controls the boom while flying prone, feeling through a window at the bottom of the tail. Both the flying boom and operator station are similar to those of the previous KC-97. A special shuttlecock-shaped drogue, attached to and trailing behind the flying boom, may be used to refuel aircraft fitted with probes. This apparatus is significantly more unforgiving of pilot error in the receiving aircraft than conventional trailing holes arrangements. An aircraft so fitted is also incapable of refueling by the normal flying boom method until the attachment is removed. A cargo deck above the refueling system can hold a mixed load of passengers and cargo. Depending on fuel storage configurations, the KC-135 can carry up to 83,000 pounds of cargo. The KC-135 was initially purchased to support bombers and the Strategic Air Command, but by the late 1960s in the Southeast Asia Theater, the KC-135 straddle tanker's ability as a force multiplier came to the fore. Mid-air refueling of F-105 and F-4 fighter bombers, as well as B-52 bombers, brought far-flung bombing targets within reach and allowed fighter missions to spend hours at the front rather than a few minutes, which was usual due to their limited fuel reserves and high fuel consumption. KC-135 crews refueled both Air Force and Navy and Marine Corps aircraft, though they would have to change to probe and drogue adapters depending upon the mission. The Navy and Marine Corps not having fitted their aircraft with flying boom receptacles since the USAF boom system was impractical for aircraft carrier operations. Crews also helped to bring in damaged aircraft, which could sometimes fly while being fed by fuel to a landing site or to ditch over the water, specifically those with punctured fuel tanks. The KC-135s continued their tactical support role in later conflicts such as Operation Desert Storm and current aerial strategy. And it looks like it's time for another course change. And you can see we just have a ridiculous amount of fuel considering <laughs> our aircraft there.
Alright. There we go. Strategic Air Command had the KC-135 Straddle Tanker in service with regular Air Force Strategic Air Command units from 1957 through 1992, and with Sakhalin Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve units from 1975 through 1992. Following a major U.S. Air Force reorganization that resulted in the inactivation of Strategic Air Command in 1992, both KC-135s were reassigned to the newly created AMC, or Air Mobility. While well, Air Mobility Command gained the preponderance of the aerial refueling mission, a small number of KC-135s were also directly assigned to the United States Air Forces in Europe, Pacific Air Forces, and the Air Education and Training Command. All Air Force, or sorry, uh, all AFRC KC-135s and most of the A and G KC-135 fleet became operationally gained by the Air Mobility Command. While well, Alaska Air National Guard and Hawaii Air National Guard KC-135s became operationally gained by Pacific Air Force. AMC manages 396 straddle tankers, of which the AFRC and ANG fly 243 and supported the AMC's mission as of May of 2018. KC-135 is one of a few military aircraft types with over 50 years of continuous service with its original operator as of 2009 or 60S of 2019. Israel was offered KC-135s again in 2013 after turning down the aging aircraft twice due to the expense of keeping them flying. Israeli Air Force again rejected the offer KC-135Es but said that it would consider up to a dozen of the newer KC-135Rs. Besides its primary role as an in-flight aircraft refueler, the KC-135 designated and KC-135 has assisted in several research projects at NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base, California. One such project occurred between 1979 and 1980 when special wingtip winglets developed by Richard Whitecomb of the Langley Research Center were tested at Armstrong using an NKC-135A tanker loaned to NASA by the Air Force. The winglets are small, nearly vertical fins installed on an aircraft's wingtips. The result of the research showed that drag was reduced and range could be increased by as much as 7% as cruise speeds. Winglets are now being incorporated into most new commercial and military transport and passenger jets, as well as business aviation jets. NASA also has operated several KC-135 aircraft without the tanker equipment installed as their famed Vomit Comet Zero Gravity Simulator aircraft. The longest serving, from 1973 to 1995, was the KC-135A Air Force Serial Number 59-1481, named Weightless Wonder 4, and registered as N9930NA. And I think it's about time to start heading home, which is going to be, I think we're going to land at Bahrain there. At least I think that's supposed to be Bahrain. No, uh, I think my range more to the south, I guess. But it is in the water. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I can always look up the base on the return trip since uh, we have uh, plenty of time. So setting a course to, let's say, 140. And let's steady out. There we go. Between 1993 and 2003, the amount of KC-135 depot maintenance work doubled and the overhaul cost per aircraft tripled. In 1996, it cost $8,400 per flight hour for the KC-135, and in 2002, this had grown to $11,000. The Air Force's 15-year estimates project further significant cost growth through fiscal year 2017. KC-135 fleet operations and support costs were estimated to grow from about $2.2 billion in fiscal year 2003 to $5.1 billion in fiscal year 2017. And that is in two, all in 2003 dollars, so it's probably closer to like, I don't know, $6 or $8 billion in 2017. An increase of over 130%, which represented an annual operating cost growth rate of around 6.2%. Air Force projected that ENR models have lifetime flying hour limits of 36,000 and 39,000 hours, respectively, 
and according to the Air Force, only a few KC-135s would reach these limits by 2040, when some aircraft would be about 80 years old. A later 2005 Air Force study estimated that KC-135E's upgraded to the R standard could remain in use until 2030. In 2006, the KC-135E fleet was flying an annual average of 350 hours per aircraft, and the KC-135R fleet was flying an aver annual average of 710 hours per aircraft. The KC-135 fleet is currently flying double its planned yearly flying hour program to meet airborne refueling requirements and has resulted in higher than forecast usage and sustainment costs. In March of 2009, the Air Force indicated that KC-135s would require additional skin replacement to allow their continued use beyond 2018. The United States Air Force has decided to replace the KC-135 fleet. However, the fleet is large and will, be need, and will need to be replaced gradually. Initially, the first batch of replacement planes was to be an air tanker version of the Boeing 767 lease from Boeing. In 2003, this was changed to contract, where the Air Force would purchase 80 KC-767 aircraft and lease 20 more. In December of 2003, the Pentagon froze the contract, and in January of 2006, the KC-767 contract was cancelled. This move followed public revelations of corruption in how the contract was awarded, as well as controversy regarding the original leasing rather than outright purchase agreement. He then Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld stated that the move would in no way impair the Air Force's ability to deliver the mission of the KC-767, which would be accomplished by implementing continuing upgrades to the KC-135 and KC-10 extender fleet. In January 2007, the U.S. Air Force formally launched the KC-X program with a request for a proposal. KC-X was the first phase of three acquisition programs meant to replace the KC-135 fleet. On the 29th of February 2008, the U.S. Defense Department announced that it selected the EADS slash North Rock Grumman KC-30 to be designated the KC-45A over the Boeing KC-767. Boeing protested the award on the 11th of March 2008, citing irregularities in the competition and bid evaluation. On the 18th of June 2008, the U.S. Government Accountability Office sustained Boeing's protest of the selection of the North Rock Grumman EADS tanker. And in February 2010, the U.S. Air Force restarted the KCX competition with the release of a revised request for proposal. After evaluating bids, the U.S. Air Force selected Boeing 767-based tanker design with the military designation KC-46 as a replacement in February of 2011. The first KC-46A Pegasus was to be delivered to the Air Force on the 10th of January 2019 and there are currently two foreign users of the KC-135, the French Air Force and the Republic of Singapore Air Force, but they have currently taken uh, deliveries of the Airbus A330 MRTTs as replacements for the straddle takers. The various variants of the KC-135A include the original KC-135A, the original production version powered by four Pratt & Whitney J57s with a total of 732 built. All right, we got a course correct again to heading 180. The NKC-135A was a test configured KC-135A. Uh, there was the KC-135B, an airborne command post version equipped with turbofan engines, of which 17 were built. They were provided with in-flight refueling capability and redesignated EC-135C and given the internal model number 717-166. The KC-135D um, was a uh, modification of the four RC-135As to partial KC-135A configuration in 1979. Four aircraft were given a unique designation KC-135D as they differed from the KC-135A in that they were built with a flight engineer's position on the flight deck. And making turns while reading is hard. There we go. And I suppose we should start uh, declining. And probably cut back on the throttle and uh, do a slow descent to save fuel. The flight engineer's position was removed when the aircraft were modified to KC-135 standards, but they retained their electrically powered wing flap secondary drive mechanism and second air conditioning pack, which had been used to cool the RC-135As onboard photo mapping systems. Later re-engined with Pratt & Whitney TF-57 
33 engines and a cockpit update to the KC-135E standards in 1990, and were retired to the 309th AMARG at Davis Monison Air Force Base, Arizona in 2007. KC-135E, to which um, Air Force KC-135As were re-engined with Pratt & Whitney TF-33 PW-102 engines from retired 707 airliners with a total of 161 modified. All E-model aircraft were retired to the 309th AMARG at Davis Monson Air Force Base by September 2009 and replaced with R models. The NKC-135E is a test-configured KC-135E Serial number 55-3132 Big Crow 1 and serial number 63-8050 NKC-135B Big Crow 2 uh, were used as airborne targets for the Boeing Yao 1 airborne laser carrier. KC-135Q was a modification of the KC-135A to carry JP-7 fuel necessary for the SR-71 Blackbird, of which 56 were modified and survivors were then further modified into the KC-135T. There were there are actually two KC-135R variants. The first in the 1960s was four KC-135As converted to rivet stand, later rivet quick configuration, for reconnaissance and evaluation of above ground nuclear tests. These aircraft were powered by Pratt & Whitney J-57 engines and were based at Uffet Air Force Base, Nebraska. Then the more common KC-135R that we know today is a re-engineering of KC-135As and some KC-135Es with CFM-56 engines, of which 417 were converted. And then there's the KC-135R CRT, which is a receiver-capable KC-135R, which only eight were modified with a Boeing or LTV receiver system and secure voice SATCOM radio. Three of the aircraft were converted to tankers from RC-135Ps, from which they retained their added equipment. The KC-135T is designation given to KC-135Qs that were re-engined with the CFM-56 engines, of which 54 were modified. The C-135F was a new build variant for France as dual-role tanker cargo and troop carrier aircraft, while were built for the French Air Force with the addition of a drogue adapter on the refueling boom. Given Boeing model numbers 717-164 and 717-165. The C-135FR is an update to the 11 surviving C-135Fs with the CFM engine between 1985 and 1988, and they were later further modified with MBRS wing pods. The EC-135Y is an airborne command post modified in 1984 to support Syncent aircraft. Uh, there was only one modified to the EC-135Y standard. Unlike its sister, the EC-135N, it was a true taker that could also receive in-flight fueling and was powered by the Pratt & Whitney PDF-33 PW-102 and was eventually retired to the 309. Because of its long, long service history, 52 straddle tankers have been lost to accidents over uh, 60 years of service as of 2020 involving a total of 385 fatalities. And, uh, as far as the general specifications of the aircraft go, okay, so we're just crossing into Kuwait now. Uh, the aircraft has a crew of three, the pilot, co-pilot, and boom operator, and some of the older ones had a navigator. Capacity includes up to 80 passengers or 83,000 pounds of cargo or six 463L pallets. Length is 136 feet 3 inches, wingspan 130 feet 10 inches, height of 41 feet 8 inches, wing area 2,433 square feet, empty weight of 98,392 pounds, an operating weight of 124,000 pounds, and a gross weight of 297,000 pounds and a max takeoff weight of 322,500 pounds, and a fuel capacity of 200,000 pounds. The four CFM International F-108-CF-100 turboplane engines produce 21,600 pounds force of thrust each. Maximum speed is 504 knots, or about Mach 
Cruise speed is 460.5 knots at 30,000 feet. Hey, so I was pretty on the ball there. A little fast, but... Uh, range is 1,303.5 nautical miles with 150,000 pounds of transferable fuel and a ferry range of 9,572 nautical miles and service ceiling of 50,000 feet and a rate of climb of 4,900 feet per minute. And I do want to give one shout out here um, as there is a wing operated uh, operating uh, KC-135s in my state actually. Uh, down in Milwaukee uh, with the Air Force National Guard. And that is the 128th Air Refueling Wing as part of the 126th Air Refueling Squadron. And uh, they often make an appearance at EAA, so special shout out to those guys. I think they're slated for transfer to the... Uh, were they slated? Uh... I think they were one of the wings that support the nuclear mission. Part of the reason why they aren't replacing all of the uh, AC-135s immediately is part of it is just the time scale. Because by the time you get through like half the fleet, you know, we will have the technology for better, cheaper aircraft. Um, but also, I know that some of the fuss about the replacement is that... Um, the KC-135 supports the nuclear mission, so basically the refueling of nuclear bombers in the event of a nuclear war. And in order to qualify for that mission, the aircraft needs special electronic shielding measures and anti-flash measures, amongst other things, some of which I'm sure are classified, but that's just the ones I know off the top of my head. Uh, the idea being to prevent them protect them from an EMP in the event of a nuclear blast, to which there is, of course, a very high probability that they might be exposed, as well as prevent protect the crew's eyes in the event of a nuclear explosion, uh, so they don't get blinded. And I know the early build variants of the KC-46 did not include provisions for the nuclear refueling mission, so that's part of the reason I think the KC-135s are uh, still being held on to, or are being replaced as part of a three-tier program. I think they were doing trials or adding some of those measures to the KC-46 so they could um, take on that mission, but I don't know where they're at. And that information, by the way, is just word of mouth um, because I talked to someone from the, 8th, the 128th uh, when they make their annual appearance at EAA. Uh, and let's see if I can see if they are transitioning or not. Uh, nope, nothing about a transition yet. I think, but like I said, I think they're one of the ones whose transition is being withheld until they get the, uh, a new tanker that can support the nuclear mission. And that is a summary of the KC-135. So now we are just going to speed on into airbase here, which I will look up now. Oh, what is it? L... Oh. Got my space there. L was... What are you? Did I not... Oh, I did not cancel out of uh, <laughs> the uh, 8x time compression there. Uh, do, 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 do. uh, do we have eyes? Nope, we do not have eyes on them. And we don't have radar, which is to be expected. So we'll just keep going until we lay eyes on the base and visually. Switch the navigation mode, not that we really have an attack mode or anything else. Uh, still don't see it. May maybe that's it there. Oh, there we go. Al Mashab. That's, uh, it's really hard to, to read that 
by the yellow text on the on the map. Yep, it is a Saudi airport. Okay, so Bahrain is uh, further south. Oh, it's right in front of us. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. All right, so we are going to line up for the approach. We can cut the throttle a little bit. I want to get down to 350 knots so we can um, deploy our landing gear here. Oh, actually, that's right, it's lower, it's 250 knots. Still, there we go. We can now lower our landing gear, and it looks like we've got a... Uh... I think we have to come to the other way? Yeah, there we go. Alright, so let us... Up. Came too far. All right, come back around. Such a tiny little base in the game. All right, cut the throttle a little bit. All right, we are. Pretty Pretty well aligned now. I think we're coming in a little too hot. So let's hit the brake and uh, try to burn off some altitude real quick here. We don't want to have a tire blowout uh, as soon as we hit the ground. There we go. I think we are golden here maybe a little more thrust uh, there we go a little early but again my one of my biggest complaints about this game is how short the runways are hey they low refueling dudes hey how are ya and it looks like they got a is that a Shaparl? M48 yeah I think that's Shaparl with the quad side winders the M163 Vulcan Air Defense System. So you can see they've got all that American equipment for the Gulf War. <laughs> there we go. Just want to get us moving as we taxi on to... Oh! oh. <laughs> uh, wow, I completely forgot. There we go. Now I have a rudder. I, I noticed that on, on landing approach, it's like, weird, my rudder doesn't seem to be... Working. Well, that's why, because when I did everything else, I forgot to reset my rudder, too. So that would have been, what, the one in three keys on the numpad, I think, is the is the rudder. Uh, oh, of course, it, it's, oh, yeah, because I have it switched to joystick, the uh, keyboard controls on the numpad are disabled. Because then you can use them for the camera. Alright, so we are just going to park ourselves outside this hardened aircraft shelter that we have no hope of ever fitting into. Ah, oh, come on. Yeah. Wanted the straight to not that out or it was gonna bug me forever a little disappointed by the general lack of detail on this aircraft but then i guess it didn't really feature in many missions you do have decals on the front though which we can't see because who camera but they look exactly like decals you'd see on you know model kits with that level of detail <laughs> like it's a little model aircraft all right so that is today's mission so let's go to debrief not that there's really a need for it successfully completed the mission yada 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 so that 
is our overview of the KC-135, the Air Force's long-serving tanker that's been at the forefront of pretty much every operation since it was introduced, keeping Allied aircraft flying further and longer. And hope to see you next time. So until then, do me. Thank you all for watching and stay tuned for next time and stay safe out there and we'll see you then.